Before I started the episode, I wanted to let everyone know the good news. I opened up a merch shop. While I work on an official website, I thought it would be fun to get a few designs up. Mostly because designing helps me de-stress during these very stressful times, but also because everyone I know has been asking if I had made Strange Origins t-shirts yet. You can find the link in the description of this episode, wherever you're listening, and there's everything from t-shirts and hoodies and kids' clothes to mugs, phone cases, notebooks, totes, and stickers. Right now, all of the earnings I make from sales will be going towards better sound equipment and help with research so that I can keep making the show better and better and put episodes out on a more regular basis. I also want to preface the episode with a giant thank you to all the new listeners that have been tuning in. I recently hit 1,400 downloads, and while that's a small number, it's a bigger number than I thought I'd ever see on my dashboard. So thank you. And now, on to the show. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 15th episode of Strange Origins. I can't believe that I've been able to produce, record, and publish 15 of these things, but here we are. I have to thank one of my listeners, Harold, for emailing me and suggesting this topic. If any of you have any requests, be sure to email me at strangeoriginspodcast at gmail.com, which is listed in the description. If you want any personal experiences to be read aloud, please include them. I would love to share your spooky stories. Golems are one of the stranger creatures I've researched. While they have been featured in shows like The Simpsons, books like Percy Jackson, and even video games like Minecraft, you don't often see golems in pop culture. They are a bit of a nondescript creature. And before you get confused, no, I'm not referring to the creature from Lord of the Rings, but rather the humanoid-like creature from Jewish folklore. While golems can be dated back to early Judaism, around 6th century BCE, images and stories of the creature are elusive. Technically speaking, a golem is an inanimate creature, usually made of clay or mud, that can be seen as a protector or workman for the Jewish community. He has rarely popped up in history, at least from the stories that I've researched, but always has a profound effect on the people around him. Their lives are short-lived and are usually only created under times of extreme duress and under the guidance of God, or so they should be. One of the reasons a golem is created is to show that a person has a mastery of what is called the Kabbalah. In the Jewish faith, Kabbalah translates to mean something akin to, quote, the received tradition. It is, from what elusive information I could find, a set of teachings concerning Jewish mysticism. While I'm sure I will delve into mysticism in later episodes, it's such a large and at times confusing subject that all I can really say about it is this. Mysticism is simply defined as a school of thought that states that extreme study and contemplation can lead to the attainment of hidden truths. Mysticism, while not designated to any particular religion, but a practice that can be initiated into any number of denominations, is closer to a mental and emotional study of the world than anything concrete. Though. Jewish folklore tells that through mastery of the Kabbalah, one can turn mysticism into reality with the same set of skills that God employed in making the universe a reality. Other reasons for the creation of the golem throughout history are as use as a trustworthy servant. In the days when farming was essential to the everyday existence of a majority of people, especially during times of plague or famine, Golems were sometimes employed as tireless servants who could help ensure the survival of their creators. 
While there was a certain amount of responsibility that went along with keeping a golem in check, it could be a great way to ensure survival. The last and most popular reason for the creation of a golem, at least in the stories that have become famous in the 21st century, was in pursuit of a protector during times of crisis and fear. While fear and persecution, especially against the Jewish community, have existed for much longer, it was really the Middle Ages and after that, that the stories of Golem that we know now and draw from were shaped. In the 17th century, a barrage of events occurred that singled out the Jewish people. This included a large contributor to poverty in the 1600s, the Thirty Years' War. For about 500 years before the events of the 17th century had even occurred, it was not uncommon that the Jewish population in general was blamed when politics went sour or uncontrollable weather caused bad crops. No. Rumors spread during the Black Plague of the mid-14th century that the Jewish community had deliberately poisoned the water wells. This led to several massacres of Jewish neighborhoods and 900 live burnings in Strasbourg. It was during the times that were most horrific for Jewish communities, both during the Middle Ages and at other times, when Golem became a sign of hope for people and a form of much needed help. Today it's thought from a historical point of view that Golems were a metaphor for the isolation, despair, and helplessness many felt during any number of wars or mass executions that the Jewish people have been through. In the 1600s, one of the most famous folklore tales of golem creation occurred. Rabbi Lowe, a Jewish mystic in Prague, gave life to a creature called the Golem of Prague. The story takes place during a period of extreme anti-Semitic violence, one instance of which saw Jewish people being killed over false accusations of using Christian children's blood in rituals. Rabbi Lowe, seeking to help his community, asked God for help. His answer was to make a golem. He after that sought the help of two other rabbis, each born with the power of one of the four elements. While the rabbis represented air, water, and fire, the golem stood as a representation of earth. They collected clay from the river and shaped it into a rudimentary form of a man. After performing a ceremony where they walked around the table counterclockwise seven times and recited special letters, the golem became animate. The creature was named Yosef. While he could not speak, he had other skills, such as that of invisibility through the help of a special amulet. He was told to protect the people of the community and did pretty well at his job. At one point, he even rescued a kidnapped girl and with his special powers, summoned a dead woman. The story had a climactic end, as myths usually do. One rule of thumb for golems is that they must rest on the Sabbath day of each week. So the Rabbi Lo made sure to give the golem that needed break. He would take out the piece of paper put into the golem's forehead, on which was written one of the many names of God in the Jewish tradition, therefore forcing it to rest. In one of the several endings to the story, the rabbi forgot to pull the paper from the creature's head, causing it to fall to pieces when finally captured in front of a synagogue. Its pieces were stored in the attic of that building, if its protection was ever needed in the future. Some versions say that a Nazi soldier went to the attic during World War II in order to stab the golem, but instead was killed, though none of these stories have had any proof behind them, as when the attic was renovated in 1883, there was nothing resembling a golem. It's possible that he disintegrated as he was simply just clay and was mistaken for a pile of dirt, but I guess we will never really know the truth. Casting the possibility of reality aside for a minute, it's most likely that the character of the golem is meant only to serve as a way of storytelling. The golem is a highly mutable metaphor with seemingly limitless symbolism. It can be a victim or villain, Jew or non-Jew, man or woman, or sometimes both. Over the centuries, it has been used to connote war, 
community, isolation, hope, and despair. End quote. Most likely, golems are a way of relaying to communities that through hard work, perseverance, and a strong belief in the good nature of people, that they can survive through what were extremely difficult and dangerous times. Where did this idea begin, though? And how have stories of golem lasted for so long? Simply put, religion created the golem, and storytelling kept him alive. In the Bible, the term golem appears in Psalm 139.16, where it said that, quote, You saw me when I was yet unformed, looked to my future, and saw all my numbered days, end quote. The word golem means, quote, my light form, or raw material. In modern Hebrew, it is often used to mean, quote, dumb or helpless. So golem, essentially, is a form of creation, his purpose on earth having already been seen. It is thought by some that the story of the creation of the first golem was featured in the book of Genesis in the Torah, which is known by others as the first five books of the Old Testament. In it, Adam was created by God out of mud. Supposing you believe in the idea that God created humans from the materials of the earth, then technically Adam was the first golem seeing as according to the Talmud, his dust was, quote, kneaded into a shapeless husk. By that logic, are we all golems? Well, not really. According to the oldest book in the Kabbalist tradition, which is called the Book of Creation, it is 22 letters and in which ways they can combine to form the name of God that give golems their ability at animation. Humans are created by God who is all-powerful, but golems are simply just the molding of materials made by God and brought to life through means of calling upon God's power. It's kind of like comparing a man and woman's ability to create a child with that child playing with dolls. It's a much more simple, crude version of life-giving. This is why in stories of golems there's usually a common ending. They are tricky creatures to make and even trickier to keep in check. It's a test to be able to keep them directed towards the right goal, well-rested and out of trouble. When his creator doesn't have the right motivations for creating him, things can go south pretty quickly. Either their creator has desire to be closer to God with his ability of creation, or the desire to be God's equal, which is an act of hubris that is present in a lot of mythological stories. Think of every time someone wanted to be equal to the Greek gods. Things never went well. One of the reasons that golems are thought to be a story of hubris, or rather a warning against excessive pride or self-confidence, is that a lot of the stories don't exactly have happy endings. Sure, the beginnings of the stories sound amazing. You can simply create a protector, a servant for yourself that never needs to eat and only sleeps once a week. But golems are obedient to a fault, meaning that they perform instructions exactly how their owners tell them to. This can lead to trouble, just as it would in the case of a genie granting wishes. In one of the earliest modern versions of a golem story titled The Golem of Chelm, a rabbi named Elijah created a golem that grew too big to be handled. As in earlier stories, it said that golems could keep growing the longer they were alive. When he had grown to the point that the rabbi feared he might destroy the world, he attempted to take down the writing from the creature's head. One story recounts that he was badly scratched on the face before being able to take the creature down, while another states that when the golem was destroyed, large piles of mud came crashing down onto Elijah, killing him. If you want to put the idea into a more modern light, it's thought by some that Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was inspired by the story. While there are unsubstantiated rumors that Mary Shelley's mother-in-law was a translator for the German Grimm brothers, it's more likely that she heard a story of the golem from a collection of stories featuring creatures formed from magic that was written in 1808 by Jacob Grimm called the Journal for Hermits. This would have been when Mary Shelley was 11 years old. While the stories of the golem and Frankenstein's monster have their notable differences, it makes sense to look at Frankenstein's monster as a type of golem. They both were reanimated by humans through the use of galvanization, 
which can either mean to stimulate with a current or to startle to action. They also feature creators who weren't quite sure how to be responsible for their creations and ended up in horrible situations because of their hubris. While the original Frankenstein novel featured a monster that was a highly intelligent creature, the character later morphed into a simple-minded brute of a character in film and television. It's interesting to note, though, that the subtitle of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was a modern Prometheus. In Greek mythology, Prometheus was the man that gave fire to the world and was punished by Zeus for eternity. What many don't realize is that Prometheus was, in some stories, a titan, or rather one of the gods that was born before Zeus's generation, and therefore was much more powerful. Prometheus is also credited with molding humans out of clay in the same form as Greek gods, and allowed for life to be breathed into them, much like a golem. As a believer in the teachings of the Greek philosopher Pythagorean, Mary and her husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley, were vegetarians and strong advocates for animal rights. Mary saw Prometheus as someone who had brought about the ability of men to eat meat by being able to cook it in a fire. Just like the rabbis in the stories mentioned earlier, and Dr. Frankenstein himself, Prometheus brought about destruction in one form or another through the creation of something ungodly. Another way of viewing the myth in a modern light is through the realization that we have our own golems. You're probably playing this podcast through one right now, except instead of being made of clay, it's manufactured in a factory. Robots assist us in everyday life, whether it's in farming, making the clothes we wear, or setting a reminder on your phone. They've allowed us to do things other than be trapped in an existence of survival, which was kind of the point of the original Golem. Something that I thought was strangely reminiscent of stories of Golems are those stories of technology rising up and destroying their creators. This idea, at least with the subject of technology, has been present in science fiction since the 1920s in Rossum's Universal Robots, and has evolved to today's movies franchises like Terminator and one of my favorite television shows, Westworld. It's a common theme, the idea that technology could become conscious and begin to fight back. Even Elon Musk, someone who is well known for dabbling in the technological world, has warned against going too far. Just like with golems, technology can and has been a double-edged sword. While it's brought about many wonderful, necessary things that we couldn't live without today, there's always the chance that it will all come crashing down, just like the golem that grew too big and who crushed his creator. Today you can see golems hidden in plain sight. Throughout the Czech Republic, the golem is a pretty popular guy, and statues of him are featured everywhere. You can even find him placed into the cobblestones of the city's sidewalks. Restaurants are named after him and statues are placed as guardians of the city of Prague. He is remembered there as a protector and a reminder of the perseverant spirit of God's first golems, us. As this episode comes to a close, I would like to thank my listeners for supporting my dream job. Without you, I would just be someone talking into a microphone at 2 in the morning in my parents' basement, like a crazy person. But still, I would love to have more to talk about. Please email me at strangeoriginspodcast at gmail.com and tell me what it is about this week's topic that interested you your suggestions for future episodes, or even stories of your own experiences with the strange and unexplained. If you would like to help this podcast grow, allowing me to make bigger, better episodes, be sure to click the follow button or even give it a five-star rating if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. If you're feeling bougie, you can also donate to my Patreon page, which is linked in the description. You can donate any amount, and each tier of donation receives great gifts like shoutouts, stickers, and even exclusive episodes. Or, if you're poor like me and would just like to enjoy more spooky stuff, 
be sure to follow my Instagram page at Strange Origins Podcast. And if you know of a friend, a sibling, a coworker, or a pet dog who would love to listen to my podcast, send them a link. It would be greatly appreciated. Be safe out there, but more importantly, guys, remember to keep it strange. Thank you.